Hello everybody, Dave Padden for St. John's Storytelling Group with you again with more stories from Labrador elders. This is part two in our series. We have the same five tellers for you, but they have different stories. And once again, thank you for watching and I hope you enjoy. St. John's Storytelling presents the second in the series, In My Time, More Stories from Labrador Elders. Well, um, I want to tell a story. Uh, my grand, my father actually uh, told me uh, about the uh, Indians, uh, an Indian man in in Davis. And that was quite a, a long time ago. I, I don't know exactly uh, what date, but I hardly suspect it before uh, Newfoundland uh, and Labrador joined Confederation in 1949. I, I think probably in 1930s, something like that. Uh, this real tall in, in Indian man. He was about six foot four, six foot five wiry as hell. In those days, anyway, uh, you'd never see a, a fat Indian man. They were all very fit, very, very healthy. So anyway, uh, this man had a girlfriend and he got her pregnant. And uh, they weren't, she wasn't on her age. He was about 22, my father said, and the girl was probably 18 or 19. So sort of a natural thing. But uh, the white authority didn't think so. So they said, well, we're going to send you to jail. So anyway, um, the Inno, Inno never went to jail. They'd never been in confined spaces. They were free people. They, they spent most of their life um, wandering in the country, chasing the caribou. So anyway, uh, the white authorities in Davis on it, uh, wait until the magistrate came on, on the coastal steamer. And uh, they, took, they, uh, they held court in a Hudson Bay uh, uh, warehouse, actually a storehouse. Um, so the they went ahead with their doings and uh, the judge or magistrate again magistrate yeah <clears throat> sentenced a man to two years in jail and there was two uh, newfound rangers uh, at the hearing so they um they uh, they were there and uh the inner man didn't understand much english if any and a, and a lot of the uh other people, you know, people are all crowded in the way the you know, are. They all stick together like 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 flies to, to butter, and because um, they had they 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 they're free people, so they had they don't have the civilized finesse, if you want to call it that, that the white man has. So they weren't paying much attention to the judge, and they were talking about talking among each other all the time in in uh, Muscatic language, and some of them understood understood what was being said by the white man, so they would talk to each other, pretending to talk to each other loudly so the man on trial could understand what was going on. <clears throat> and uh, so they would they would translate un, unbeknown to the authorities, uh, uh, tell them the, the uh, defendant, I guess you call him, uh, what was happening. <laughs> and uh, it's kind of funny really, uh, they didn't pay much attention to, to, to authority, didn't pay any attention to authority. So the guy on trial actually knew what they were, what the white man was up to. So anyway, he got sentenced to two years in jail. So these two rangers took him, um, one on each arm, and marched him out of the, the, the shed, the warehouse. Outside the warehouse, on one side was a sawhorse with, uh, with wood and axe and saw and all that. And on the other side was a bunch of barrels that we used, they used to use to pickle uh, uh, char and uh, salmon and codfish for shipping. And this guy was, was six foot four, six foot five, 22 years old, fit as a fiddle. And when he got outside and he knew what they were going to do, they were going to put him on the ship and take him off to jail in St. John's. And those other people were never lived in a house, let alone in a bit locked up in a jail. I mean, I don't know if he felt that he might lose his spirit in that manner by being locked up, but <clears throat> he damn well didn't want to go to jail. So when they got outside the building, he was strong enough, he gave it ranged it on one side, a big shove, and the guy got tangled up in a sawhorse and the axe and the wood and saw and everything else, went ass over kettle. And then they gave the other guy a, a, a shove, 
off to the other side, and he got tangled up in the in the barrels, and he ran away. He's six foot four, six foot five, and he ran away in the woods, and in no time, he was gone. I mean, you, you probably you know, man, those days in the woods, and forget about it. You're not gonna, you're not gonna, uh, you're not gonna see him. You're not gonna hear him. You're not gonna catch him. So anyway, the <clears throat> rangers chased after him, but I mean, uh, he was long gone by then. So. And then when he went in there with hot in the summertime, flies and, and, and everything else. And, and uh, they, they didn't see any, any sign and hear any sound, nothing. So, so they came back, had to give it up and said, we'll, we'll probably get him when he comes out, out of the woods in the nighttime. So they waited for him in, in the encampment there where, where there's Hudson Bay buildings and my father's house. <clears throat> and... Uh, a whole bunch of teepees. There were no tents back those days. Uh, they, they lived in teepees. I don't even scatter tent, but uh, not, um, teepees were the, were the um, more of the day. So uh, <clears throat> that, that evening, uh, the white man, the rangers, searched all through the woods. And of course, the Innu people knew what was going on. And so they would uh, make suggestions of where they thought the Innu man would be. But it was all a lie. They just playing tricks and playing games on a white authority, and they had a wonderful time laughing and joking and talking right in front of the white people and telling each other what they're going to do, how they're going to help this guy that to escape. So anyway, dark that night, he came out of the woods. My father said, and he went to his grandmother's grand grandmother's wigwam and crawled up in an, underneath the flat. They were expecting him anyway, so they had food cooked. They had uh, fish and. Uh, Lots of bannock made, lots of, lots of stove cake, we call it bannock. So they, and then they had clothing and a sleeping bag and, uh, or sleeping hides, everything that he would need in the woods because they knew he'd have to run away again. So, uh, anyway, he, 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 uh, had a big old feed and, uh, uh talked to his people and got replenished with, uh, with food and good spirit. And took his uh, things he needed to survive him in the woods, and they went back in the woods again. And the next day, of course, the Indians tricked the white men <laughs> really bad. They sent them all over the bloody place, uh, just just fast leads all the time. And uh, they were so frustrated and hot, sweaty, and fly, and eating up with the flies, and they never saw him. This went on for about two months. Uh, he he kept going in the woods. He was he he wouldn't stay in the encampment. He, he'd come back and he'd get supplies. But then he'd run away in the woods again, and he stayed in the woods. And my mother said, he said he even made a made a canoe of sorts of some hide and some birch bark. But it was all a big joke with the Inu people that wouldn't float anyway. But so he stayed in the woods uh, the whole summer, and then when when like the end of the summer come, uh, the last steamer took the uh, rangers uh, and the magistrate and all the white authority and went south. And that's when he came out and joined his people. Uh, across a big festivity then, a big feed, big drumming, all night, all night long drumming and, and dance. I love the way they know dance. I love that, that inner circle and it's the beat, beat, beat and that forward, backward, forward, backward more movement. Uh, I've done that lots of times in my young days and old days too. <clears throat> anyway, they had a big old celebration when they got out of the woods and there was nobody to arrest them. And uh, so they, they went in the country and then his girlfriend uh, had a baby. Uh, in the country. Uh, they, they spent the whole winter doing what the Arbys did, chasing the caribou, living their lives free, which they've always done too. <clears throat> and the next spring, they all come back to David, including the tall man, who I know his name, but I'm not going to mention it. Actually, my brother married one of his daughters later on. Uh, anyway, they came back the next year, and the, one ranger came this time, and uh, same thing happened. People tricked the, uh, the authorities, sent them on wild goose chases, and they never found that guy that, that summer either. <clears throat> so when they left, the priest was in that in, in the area. So the man and woman got married. And uh, I mean, what did they do wrong? I mean, it's natural what they did. So they got married, and uh, and, and he, he lived to be a ripe old age. I, I, I remember him. I remember him in the seventies and eighties, and he was, oh gee whiz, he was. Uh, I, I, I would highly suspect he was close to 90 by then, or maybe even 90, over, over 90. And uh, he lived a fruitful life and a good old life and never had any trouble after. I mean, uh, but I tell you one thing, he had, uh, not only him, but the whole 
try that a grand time uh, fooling the authorities and getting away with the, uh, with something that uh, never should have been charged with in the first place, in my opinion. So that's just a show you that the native ingenuity ruled, uh, ruled the day. Well, Dave, uh, I could tell you about when I was in training to be a nurse with Dr. Tony and, and Florence, the nurse, in Northwest River. I was a teenager, so it was in the, um, uh, it was in the 40s, early 40s. Um, at that time, in the summer, I, I went home across the river and my sister Phyllis and I uh, were playing on the beach and then one rainy day uh, a plane was coming to try to build the base in the early years and the plane crashed out in the bay. I'm on the Sesashi side of the river looking out into the bay, look across the Kinwish. A plane went down and we knew that it was a boat plane. It never had pontoons, it was a boat. And uh, they used to anchor off out there. And when the plane went down, it crashed. They had come from Goose Bay. They had been here early days of building the base. And all hands were lost, the, the crew that was on that plane. And so for about two days, the wind was in on the beach, big sea surf wa washing up. And that was out maybe a mile or two from our shore the plane crash. And my sister Phyllis, three years older than me, and two younger brothers, Tom and, and Horace, uh, Sheila's dad, we decided to walk the beach to see if any of the crew was aboard that plane was washing up on the beach because the wind was in. And when we kept looking and looking, my sister was very nervous about dying people or the dead. But this time, all of a sudden I said to Tom, oh, I can see a foot in the seaweed. The wind was bringing a body to our beach and out a few feet from the sandbar where we walked on a rainy day, I could see a foot in the seaweed. The four of us ran in the water right up to our armpits because we were only young. And we uh, we got him by the two feet and the two arms. It was a man from that crash. And we hauled the body in on the beach and ran to our house and reported we found one. And we got a blanket to cover him up. And my brother had to get in a rowboat and row across the river to tell the Newfoundland police, Newfoundland rangers, they were not RCMP yet then. And the police came over in a speedboat and got the body. And through wireless operations, uh, communications early years before telephones, he he talked to them on base and say, one body was found, the plane has crashed. And I said to my sister later, how come you were brave enough to dive into the water with us and haul the body ashore? And her story was, his mother would be glad if somebody even found his body. And she was always nervous about everything. She had to sleep with a lamp light in the night because she was afraid in the dark. But she helped us, four of us, we had our arm each and our leg each, and we dragged him ashore. And, uh, and the, the ranger came and took the body. And then people flew down from Goose Bay and got the body. So we don't know his name. We think it was Fontaine. But we don't know that for sure from Quebec. First of all, what I used to do growing up in Mulligan. Yeah. I'll start off with 
what we used to re entertainment. Sure. So we used to play a lot of baseball. Uh -huh. And we had to make our own balls. So that was kind of hard to get a good ball made. What did you make them out of? You just have a piece of cloth and stuff it with whatever you could get moss or oh. anything and sew it up. And then we used to play a lot of football. So that was that was hard to get the football. What did you use for that? But, you know, the best thing we ever used was seal putties. Oh, okay. Or harp putties. Yes, eh? But you could only get them in the spring. So it, you know, old harp putty, you, you'd save them all. All right. And you had to blow them up. And it was the same as a ball then when you throw it up. <laughs> so that's what we used to okay. sport we used to play football and baseball a lot. And that was in Mulligan? That was in Mulligan. Okay. First in the spring we used to have the row up here. Get food. We row back to Mulligan. And then Get ready and pack up everything. We only had a little 14 foot rowboat and all of our stuff, dogs and everything. We'd start rowing down for Malia. How far is that? Oh, I guess what is it? about 60 miles, I guess. And if it's really good weather, no way you do it in three days, but sometimes you could be a week, two weeks, a blow, and you could have to wait for a damn time. It wasn't easy going. This was every spring, was it? Every spring we do that. Yeah. And then in around the end of July, we draw back up again. Okay. So you were out salmon fishing then? Yeah, we were out salmon. It must have been later in July when you come back. End of July, oh, yeah. middle of August. Okay. Yeah. Did you used to uh, plant like vegetables and that and leave them for the summer and go? Yeah, we'd always have a garden. Oh. And so in the spring, where we'd leave. Yeah. And then we come back, we'd have vegetables. Oh, very good. Okay. And did was there a school in Mulligan? Yeah, there was a school. And Evelyn, Evelyn was the teacher, was she? She was there one year, I think. Evelyn Campbell. We had different teachers. Uh, yeah, to, I don't think she taught you, though. No, I didn't. She didn't that teach after. That before. I, no, after, after you were I was finished. Yeah. But we had uh, a teacher from Newfoundland. Okay. Yeah. And, and what was summer like in Mulliac? What, what we were... Just up every morning out fishing, was it? Fishing, yes, salmon fishing. Yes. Okay. You get pretty busy getting the, getting the nets clean. And, and who did you sell all your salmon to? To Hudson Bay Company like, Regular. Oh, okay. Yeah. They had a collector boat come around and pick them up every day. Every day? Yeah. Oh. So what, did you salt it? Or? No, fresh. Fresh, okay. Yeah. Well, after they're done fresh, they used to salt some. They buy the salt too. Oh, okay. Very good. Now, how many people in Mulliac in those days? In Mulliac? Yeah. There was uh, our family and Uncle Earl and uh, uh, the Blakes. Oh, the Blakes, okay. That's their first. And then Fern Pottle and then. So, so then in the fall when it was over, or in late July, what was it like coming back up? You must have had a headwind. Coming back up, cause in the fall when there was a lot of wind, you'd wait days sometimes before you could get a start on. Yeah. Sometimes you'd leave Molly off and only get to Carvalho. That wasn't very far. Cause yeah. You might be caught there two or three days before you get a good day again. 
Did you stay with people or did, were you, no, did you we had have tents? No, we had the camp. Oh, you had tents? Yeah. yeah. Camp every night. Oh, okay. And then, and then, when you were up for the winter, was it trapping then, or just trapping in the winter? Yeah. Okay. Where did you trap? Now in the fall, when we get up, we had to come up here, get row up here, again to get food. The last time the ice come. Yeah. But sometimes we just be lucky. We would only rock to the islands and Uncle Willie or Uncle Freeman be coming up in their motorboat. Oh, okay. That was easy then. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So, and sometimes they get up at Uncle Don or he had a motorboat in Mulligan. Okay. But all them ones used to leave in September to go trap me in Van River. What did they? Yeah. yeah. Okay. But you were in Mulligan all winter, were you? Yeah, we were in Mulligan all winter, yeah. And did you trap inland we, from there? Yes, trap inland there. Oh, okay. And down to... Yeah, down to... Down, we yeah. to trap the shore right down. Oh, okay. Almost to Charlie's Point. What What was Christmas like there? Well, Chris, Christmas, it was... Uh, they always have a dance and stuff like that. Yeah. Did people come in from other places? Yes, sometimes. If we, okay. From Narcissus Island, they used to come down. Always come down. And the Chucks, did they come up from Pearl River? And, yeah. Yes, eh? Yeah. yeah. They, they, well, that, that must have been pretty nice. Oh, yes. Yeah. It's a, quite a big thing, Christmas. Yeah. There'd be a big, big feed, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, years ago, oh, I suppose this was in the early, around 1900 or whatever, that then later too than that, that uh, Dr. Grenfell, he would take a lot of the, not a, a lot, I suppose, but he'd always take some children to the orphanage. I don't know how he determined which ones to take or whatever. And my grandmother, that's uh, my dad's mom, her father had died when they were fairly young and she said that uh, Dr. Grenfell came there anyway sometime later and her mother she had the children there was some of them was old enough to work so he decided he was going to take one of them to to St. Anthony I mean to yeah I suppose to the orphanage but she didn't want to let her little boy go and he took the, bit, the little boy anyway and she was out in the water up to her waist crying for her baby and they went on and he never ever came back to Labrador after he grew up and he stayed in St. Anthony. I don't know if you're familiar of here and tell of the Newells in St. Anthony. Yes. Yeah, John Newell and them. That's that was my grandmother's oh. brother went there and later his son John was and yeah. So uh, but she used to always hear from him. Grandmother yeah. did. He always wrote her. And um, after he died. She didn't hear from for a long uh, any of them for a long time, but uh, my father was in to the hospital in St. Anthony. That was in the fall of '69, and he asked about it and he met John. But after that, we always heard from one of his sisters. Kit. She was the owner. There was a big crowd then, but so John's boys. We've met John's boys and um, the most of them. I mean, two or three of them, and well, there's only three, I think, and then. Um, Kit, I I met her a couple of times. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Was but, a, there was a mailman named Steve Newell. Yes. Does that sound familiar? Yes, that's that's right, Steve Newell. Now, grandmother had a brother, Steve Newell, too, but that wasn't a mailman. The mailman was, um, uh, I think he was a brother to, uh, to grandmother's uh, husband. Grandmother's father, yeah, his name was John, and Steve Newell was his brother, I think. Okay. Yeah, he ran the mail between uh, Riglet and McCovic Way. Yes, because Dad used to follow his trail sometimes. Okay, you know? yeah. yeah, and later years, 
after I guess he was older and couldn't do it, uh, uh, grandmother's brother Arthur Newell did it. Because Daddy said he went back and forth to McCauley on dog team mm. a few times with his Uncle Arthur. And uh, I can remember the first time that I ever saw Uncle Thorsten um, Anderson from McCauley, and we were on the mission plane. And when we stopped in the hospital in St. Anthony, he looked at me and he said, we went some lot faster than we went with your uh, dad on dog team, he said, collecting the mail. Yeah. But, yeah, it was people, it was hard getting around. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, they didn't think of it as hard as sports. Well, that's the only way you had to get around. But, yeah. yeah. My father, he, he only had one arm. He had his arm taken off, I think, because, uh, I don't know, it was infected or something like that. TB. Uh, yeah. And uh, he'd be pushing with one arm like that in the boat. And I was in, in my teens then, and I used to put my two feet down against the, the, rib, the crossing the boat, the stick across the boat. And, and uh, I'd have two hands on one hour. And he used to say, he said, boy, he said, she's turning, he said. You know, that's the strength he had in, in, in one hand. And, and, and cut wood, he could cut wood, as, as, cut just as much as my, as my older brothers. Okay. And, and his pipe, he could fill his pipe. He put his tobacco in his hand. And and he he break it up with his thumb, and put it into his pipe. Never yeah. need any help for anything, you know. He, yeah, he could do anything. I guess everybody was pretty tough then, and he yeah. was tougher than most. Yeah, you had to be. See, you had to yeah. do it. You know, you so, you had to. Did he it. move up here in '46 to? A whole yeah, family? he moved up here too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. And my mother moved up there, and, and uh, she 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 died up here with a heart attack, okay. the first year up here. But my father, he he died down down to Moliac, down to when, when we were fishing, and and he had the caught pneumonia. Oh, did pneumonia. What And he sat up in the bed in the night, and he looked over, over across the narrow, across the bay, and he said it's foggy out, and he leaned back down, and he was gone. Yeah. A big thank you to our Labrador elders for their wonderful stories. Alex Saunders, Jean Crane, Garland Bakey, Sarah Bakey, and Morris Pop Blake. Original music, Northern Glory by Alan Byrne. Labrador Flag Photo by John Martin. Thank you to our funders for their continued support. The City of St. John's, Arts NL, Newfoundland and Labrador Arts Council, Canada Council for the Arts, Canadian Heritage, Building Communities Through Arts and Heritage, Newfoundland and Labrador, Cultural Economic Development Program, Host and Videographer, Dave Padden. Video editing and captioning, Raisin Arm Productions. Come to our story circle. Learn about our in-person and online events at storytellingstjohns.ca.
Copyright St. John's Storytelling 2020.